good afternoon. It is New Year's Day, the beginning of New Year. Very exciting. I do hope that this New Year is better than last New Year, as uh, it was very much a Covid year, and I mean the hundreds of thousands of cases now, but they seem to be with the Omicron strain, they seem to be much less virulent anyway. Let's hope it's a better year for us all. Now what I'm going to do today is I'm going to answer some of the questions that you ask me and we can see uh, how we go with that. So the first question is a question about somebody whose mother has recently died from cancer and who misses his mum very much indeed. Uh, very common feeling. Um, what, what can I do that I can have contact with her, see her, or can talk with her? What can I do? What do I have to practice for that? Or will it be just an illusion? Now, this is a really interesting question. Because in fact, what we're looking at is after-death communication. Now, there's been a lot of work done on after-death communication, and they are extremely common. So, uh, is there any chance that he will hear from his mum? Probably about a 90% chance, so they're as common as that. And after-death communications take on several different roles. The first one of which is that they can either be very intense or very small. They can, or very weak I should say, or they can um, uh, be immediately after death or it can be a, a few weeks or even a month before they appear. And of course they can appear in dreams uh, as well as during the waking state. And so what sort of thing is an after-death communication? Well, after somebody has died, you can feel the person sometimes in bed with you. You can hear them talking. Scent is a very common way, either the scent that uh, his mother will have put on or if it was uh, a male, then of course, not so much these days, smoking, the sense of smoke or smelling smoke uh, would be another way of, of the after death communication appearing. So yes, they do appear, they are common and uh, they are um, something which about 90% of us will have. Now, interesting question. Are they just the brain? Are the brain just uh, remembering the person? Um, I don't think so, and what's my reason? Uh, the reason is that there are many different accounts where the person gives information that could not have been known. So your brain couldn't make up this information if it's correct. And I told you last time about Swedenborg and the lost receipt and the secret drawer. Nobody could have known this if they hadn't actually been that individual. Or else we'll have to think of uh, some very, very other special characteristic of the world. But I think for the moment uh, it looks as if a transfer of, of consciousness at the time of death is a very good explanation for it. So. Um, the other thing is that he asks, um, uh, is it just an illusion? What can I do to contact her? Well, you can talk to people who are very good at after-death communications. And these are, of course, mediums. You want to treat, uh, you want to find a medium who's good and honest, and then just sit down in front of them and see if they tell you that your mother has come and if she has any messages for you and I expect you'll have some for her. So that's another perfectly valid way of doing it. Okay, so thanks for the question. The next one is 
Um, I'm 16 year old teen from Colombia where I first started thinking about what happens to us when we died. And he became very, very anxious. Now this is called the existential fear of death. Yes, uh, one does feel very anxious uh, when you think about death to the extent, if you remember, that it can change your behavior. And if you look up some of the other posts I did when I was doing existential fear of death, I pointed to an experiment with judges. Those who had been exposed to death gave much heavier sentences than those who didn't. So it changes our behavior. So it's not surprising that he would sit down and cry. Um, but now he's been looking around and uh, he's coming across the sort of information which is available to us all now in the Bigelow essays on the continuation of consciousness after death. And I would again recommend any of you who have any fear that it's all going to end with a switch off when you die, is to look at this and then make up your own minds as to what you think. Uh, next question. And this, this is a, a, a really interesting question. Why? Does everybody whose heart stops and they go unconscious, why don't they all get NDEs? I hear Casper. Casper, come here. Casper. Um, why don't they all get NDEs? Uh, and in fact, uh, he gives a figure of about 80% don't get an NDE and 20% do. And that, that was a little higher than the figure which we had in our study. Well, the way that I formulate this is that probably everybody has a, a, a near-death experience and would have these experiences, but they don't remember them. And the reason they don't remember them is that the memory circuits, of course, are very disrupted during cardiac arrest. So I think that's the most likely explanation for the 20% who do. And the uh, other thing about that is that uh, there are different, uh, different qualities to a near-death experience in those that are remembered. Some are very intense and some aren't. And so if they are saying, showing you the same sort of area, those death area, um, why would the qualities be different? And I think that it's really in the report and our ability to report accurately what occurred during the NDE. Uh, next one. Um, somebody is talking about a post-death communication. So at the time of death, come on Casper, Casper come here little boy. Uh, sorry about Casper. So uh, at the time of death, 350 miles away, he was unaware of her death at that time, but he had this message from her and uh, for a moment, his world that he was in uh, glowed bri brilliantly and uh, the interpretation was that his... Casper, dear Casper, come here, little boy, come here, come on, come up here, come on, there's a good boy. Um, the, uh, that his mum was showing him uh, what it was like to die. Now, this isn't as strange as you think, because we've had a number of accounts of people who have in some way shared the actual death process. And uh, he talks about a brilliant white, a uh, brilliant white comma, uh, uh, brilliant white light is quite common in the death experience itself. So, um, Yes, it, it is possible that, in fact, he, uh, 
he did in fact have a uh, a deathbed coincidence deathbed coincidence meaning that he heard or felt something about or get a message from the person who is actually dying and again uh, if if you want validation of this then you go and see a medium and ask them a little bit about it okay and the last one that we have time for today incidentally can, you may not be able to see but Casper is now here and they're sitting on my knee um, and he's a poet boy aren't you uh, He's, the question states that he had a severe asthma attack where he lost consciousness twice. So he's had two attacks and lost consciousness. Um, and he, during this period of unconsciousness, he describes it as a sweet sleep. Now, asthma attacks are very frightening. And on one of them, he woke up. But the interesting thing about this is that he got a message. And the message was that uh, if he went back to sleep again, then that would be the end of his time on this planet. Now, uh, is that possible? What does it mean? Well, uh, the idea that uh, in, a, in an NDE, because it was sort of NDE-like, that you come to a border is uh, very common. And the border can be anything it can be a voice saying go back because it's not your time it can be a door through which you know if you go you won't return same with the river if you cross or a bridge that you cross these are all boundaries and the boundaries are such that if you cross the boundary you won't come back and this is very much like what happened to him uh, Yes. Uh, how do we know it was an NDE? Because it has taken away his fear of death. So it was a profound, life-changing experience, and he had absolutely no doubt it was an NDE. And I, I think that from what he said, I would, I would certainly agree with him. So again, uh, if you do have these experiments, experiences, then some of them you may come to a boundary when you're either sent back or know if you cross the boundary you won't come back so there we are those are our questions for this time next time i think i will do the sorts of world that our science uh, now suggests when i say our science now suggests i'm not talking about reductionist science which is prominent from uh, the beginning of the 1900s. I'm talking about quantum mechanics, which has come in since then, because in a reductionist science, everything is separate. It's all little particles independent of each other. With quantum mechanics, as I, I, I will explain, everything is one thing. They're all interconnected and they become separate um, when they uh, manifest but until then they're all separate at any rate that's for next time so thanks very much indeed and we'll see you later okay bye <laughs>